program today is about the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, and the discussion is going to be hosted by my colleague, uh, Bill Greenbaum. Good morning, everyone. As Chris pointed out, the last part of the program today is going to deal with audits by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, better known as the OFCCP. Uh, the OFCCP is, and these, this program is one of the requirements, once you sign to be a government contractor or subcontractor, you are going to be subject to these requirements. Let's see if I can move this slide to the next one here. Who is covered by this affirmative action non-discrimination requirement? Well, first of all, it's contractors and subcontractors of the federal government being subject to equal employment opportunity and affirmative action uh, uh, requirements. You are covered if your government contract is greater than $10,000. You have to comply with the EEO and affirmative action clauses. The big requirement though, is for an affirmative action program, or as better known as affirmative action plan. And an AAP is required if you have 50 or more employees and a government contract of $50,000 or more. That requires you to prepare an affirmative action plan for minorities and women. There are two additional affirmative action plans one for veterans, also 50 employees or more, but you have to have a $150,000 contract with the government. The veterans requirement allows a, an aggregation of contracts to reach $150,000 rather than a single contract, believe it or not. Uh, and finally, there's a individuals with disabilities affirmative action plan, which requires 50 employees and $50,000 contract. Uh, it used to be that the one AAP was all that was gonna be audited, but now the disabled individuals and veterans plans have numerical requirements of goals and timetables, just like women and minorities. So let's talk a little bit about these audits because it's the audit which is the primary responsibility on the contractor. The OFCCP schedules audits to determine whether the government contractor is complying with the EEO and affirmative action requirements of those three laws. The executive order 11246 for minorities and women the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, also known as Section 503 for individuals with disabilities, and VIVRA, which is the Veterans uh, Employment Act, which governs veterans. The way it works is the OFCCP sends out a letter scheduling a facility for an audit. Generally speaking, it's one site or one facility which is audited, not the entire company, one facility at a time. And the way that works is if the company survives that audit or succeeds in that audit, uh, they usually don't go on to another facility. But if there's some issues, there's a very good chance that the uh, OFCCP will expand to another facility uh, until um, they're satisfied that you're you're fully in compliance. Now, this is the U.S. Department of Labor, and they, uh, the OFCCP is part of the U.S. Department of Labor. Department of Labor now al allows online submission of most of this data. They prefer to get it online at this point. And if you're going to be audited, you basically have a 30-day timetable, a 30-day period to submit what you're being uh, asked for. In the COVID era, extensions have been allowed, 30-day extensions have been allowed, but the latest information from the OFCCP is that they're going to stop being as generous as, as they've been with extensions. 
uh, the, the online submission needs to be thorough and complete and uh, is the beginning of the process. The other thing that's very interesting today as we speak is the OFCCP is not necessarily doing a full-blown audit of all of your employment policies and practices. They've decided to start doing what are called focused reviews. And the reviews, in addition to submitting your affirmative action plans, they're focusing on, for example, accommodations whether you're making reasonable accommodations to religion and disability, whether you are treating your employees not only with uh, equal employment opportunity, but you're going out of your way to accommodate people with maybe different religious beliefs and whether you're accommodating people with disabilities. Another type of focused review that's been occurring this year and will certainly continue into next year are reviews that are really precisely focused on your compensation practices. Are you paying women as much as you're paying men? Are you paying minorities as much as you're paying men or white folks? Third area of focused reviews are promotions. Same thing. Are you promoting women and minorities at the same rate as you are promoting men, white men? And there are quite detailed sets of information that the OFCCP has been requesting in addition to your affirmative action plan to help them review compensation and promotion practices. Finally, this year and next year to be to be sure, uh, veterans are a focal point of the OFCCP and how you are handling uh, your recruiting efforts for veterans, how you are handling promotions for veterans and compensating veterans appropriately within your system. The way these audits work is that there's a two-part process. First, there's a desk audit. That's when you submit your affirmative action plans and any other additional information that the OFCCP has requested. And they throw this information into some very sophisticated computer programs that they have to determine whether there's any kind of what they call adverse impact. They will get red flags of areas where they feel you're not doing everything you should be doing with respect to women, minorities, veterans, and individuals with disabilities. And the desk audit is basically their way of pinpointing any issues or problems that occur that they are gonna focus on when they come on site. It's extremely rare these days that a desk audit takes place without the on-site audit. Now, the on-site audit is a series of interviews with the head human resources manager and often some other managers, department managers, where the OFCCP has determined that there may be an underutilization of women or minorities or there's some adverse treatment of veterans or individuals with disabilities, or there's some compensation discrepancies or promotion discrepancies. But you can expect that once you've received a scheduling letter and once you've submitted your AAP, that you're gonna be subject to both the desk audit and the on-site audit. The good news about audits for the, for the current time period is, as most of you know, the government's fiscal year begins October 1, or began October 1. There will be no more scheduling letters for the remaining three months of 2020. New scheduling letters are likely to go out for 2021 in late December and early January, possibly extending into mid and late January. So you'll have a pretty good idea whether you're gonna have an audit in 2021 come December or January.
So what do you need to do if you get one of these scheduling letters and then you get the actual 30-day letter to submit your AAPs? Well, you better have your AAP ready to go. Uh, you have 30 days from the day they ask for it. Uh, you need to put it into completely tip-top shape. Uh, if you do an AAP on a calendar year basis, you pretty much have to scramble in January and February to put your new plan together. If you don't do it on a calendar year basis, which is perfectly fine, then you have to make sure that your plan is updated and ready to go for an audit. What else are they going to ask for besides the affirmative action plan? They're going to ask for massive information about your applicant flow, how many people applied for each job, and what kind of a job you did in terms of hiring a proportionate number of minorities, women, and people of various national origins. So the applicant flow process is very, very important. Promotion and termination data. If it's a regular audit, then they're going to ask for some fairly routine promo promotion and termination data. If it's a promotion focused audit, then they're going to ask for a lot more promotion information because that's pretty much what they're going to be studying in the desk audit and then uh, delving into deeper in the on site audit. Recruiting activities. That's part of every single audit. The OFCCP wants to know that you are reaching out in your recruitment efforts. You're going to sources, better sources for minorities, for veterans, and for disabled individuals. And among those sources that they're going to be looking to make sure you take advantage of is the state employment service. It's also called the state workplace service. Every state uh, has a, an agency that you need if you're a government contractor to sign up with and make sure that when you have job openings for jobs essentially under $50,000 a year that you post them through the state employment service website and they're going to look for that in terms of your immediate audit response and then they're going to delve into that more when they come on site and talk to you about what your affirmative action efforts have been. Finally, compensation data. Compensation is becoming one of the primary areas of focus for the OFCCP. Whether or not it's a focused review on compensation or a general audit of a facility, they're going to ask for some significant compensation data and they want it to come through into their website in probably an Excel format so that they can study it, throw it into their computer program and make sure that there's not adverse impact with respect to women and minorities, people with disabilities and veterans. So key compliance areas. Number one, technical compliance. Technical compliance means your affirmative action plans are properly set up, that you have all of the provisions of the affirmative action plans that the government regulations, the OFCCP regulations require. They're very clearly laid out both under the executive order and for individuals with disabilities and for veterans. The plans are slightly different for, for each of those categories, but technical compliance and having a real AAP that has the required provisions. Compliance is beyond the affirmative action plan. It requires personnel activities in recruiting, hiring, promoting that also demonstrate affirmative action uh, by the government contractor. Next, compensation. Very important now. It used to be the technical compliance was more important than some of these other areas, but there's no area more important to the OFCCP 
at this time than demonstrating that your compensation practices do not discriminate against females, minorities, the disabled, or veterans. Promotions is becoming another area of focus for the OFCCP more than it ever was before. And you need to be able to show that with respect to your promotions within the workplace, you are not only demonstrating equal employment opportunity, but also affirmative action efforts. If there's a choice between a female and a male, you can't all, and they're equally qualified. They're not going to let you every single time promote the male over the female or the white over the minority. And that gets to the final point, which is always one of the major areas of emphasis for the OFCCP. You establish goals as part of your AAP process, but progress, demonstrating progress toward those goals is probably the most important area of compliance that they're gonna look for when you're audited. Progress doesn't mean progress overnight. Progress doesn't mean reaching your goal overnight or in a year or even two years, but you need to show that through your recruiting efforts and your hiring decisions and your training of your human resources folks, your outside recruiters and your managers, that you are really making progress toward any underutilization goals that you've established in your affirmative action plans. So that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Before I do that though, one more slide here. Uh, the consequences of non-compliance. Three things, if you are not demonstrating to the OFCCP that you're fully compliant, you risk three consequences. One, you may enter into a conciliation agreement with the OFCCP that you will establish either higher goals or you will commit to reporting to them on your progress versus existing goals or that you will do more in the way of compensation for minorities, women, individuals with disabilities, and veterans. And it's going to be a year or a two-year conciliation agreement in which you make these commitments and you submit reports to the OFCCP. That's the normal consequence of any kind of noncompliance. The second consequence is a consent order, which is much more formal in terms of the legal process, and it's going to be subject to review by either the solicitor of labor or a higher level aspect of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. It's going to go beyond the compliance officer or team of compliance officers that audits your facility. And it's pretty serious because if you're not complying with that consent order, you risk the next, uh, the next stage, which is the ultimate sanction of debarment. And debarment means that if you don't demonstrate compliance, you're going to be required to, you're going to lose your government contracts. So I think we're probably at the end of the line here and I'll turn it back over to Chris. Bill, thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, and having represented uh, federal contractors for a while, I can tell you that OFCCP is an important area and it's something that when it comes up, will definitely occupy your HR team uh, for quite a period of time as they, as they respond, for sure. So that, you know, with Bill's presentation, that concludes uh, our presentation for today. As I said at the beginning, uh, we've got another uh, couple of hours tomorrow morning just to clear up any uh, scheduling uh, uh, concerns. The, the uh, webinar will open at about 7.45 and the, the program will start right at 8 o'clock tomorrow and uh, continue until about 10.
So we'll look forward to, to everyone rejoining us uh, tomorrow for the second half of the program. If you have any questions in the meantime, you can feel free to give us, uh, give us a call or send us an email. And if you have any issues that you'd like uh, us to address tomorrow as part of the program, uh, feel free to reach out in the meantime.